Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marv Bolt, and I'm the curator of science and technology at the Corning Museum of Glass. And I'm delighted to host this week's episode of Connected by Glass, with a focus on how glass helps us interact with microscopic worlds. How can we use tiny, inexpensive pieces of glass to see and avoid organisms that cause sickness? And how can we add specific atoms to glass surfaces that will stop the spread of disease? In the next few minutes, we're going to explore two very different and amazing technologies. We'll have a look at and a look through a carefully engineered low-tech microscope and also examine the workings of an intricately engineered glass that uses sophisticated chemistry. These technologies have and will continue to have an enormous positive impact on public health around the world. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. First, Dr. Jim Sobolski, CEO, co-founder, and co-developer of Foldscope, a revolutionary microscope, microscope costing less than $1 to make. Second, Dr. Paula Moreno-Roman, who recently joined Foldscope as Director of Strategic Partnerships. And third, Dr. Timothy Gross, Research Fellow at Corning Incorporated. He's the primary inventor of several iterations of Gorilla Glass and also of the antimicrobial glass Guardian. As we get started, I'll remind our viewers and listeners that you can ask your questions on our YouTube or Facebook platforms at any time. That will get them in the queue and our speakers will have the opportunity to respond to them in the concluding part of this episode. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about how we can use glass to save lives. In particular, using glass to deal with tiny organisms such as bacteria and viruses. All life on Earth has been impacted and shaped by them, but our first visual encounter happened in the 1670s. About 350 years ago, a Dutch cloth merchant named Anthony van Leeuwenhoek used single lens microscopes like the one shown here. And I happen to have a replica of one in my hand. And I will show you that in a moment. He used those single lens microscopes to look at organisms in pond water, as well as bacteria, red blood cells, sperm, dental plaque, and other things. So even though people were intrigued, it took more than 200 years before scientists and medical doctors were convinced that microorganisms can cause disease and death. Today, we know these tiny agents number in the millions or possibly billions of species. And there are likely more microbial cells on Earth than there are grains of sand on Earth and more than there are stars in the universe. Now, during the next half hour, we're going to limit our attention to just a few of them, and we'll explore how we can use glass to engage with them. Seeing microscopic creatures is so important today for medicine and public health. And we know doctors and scientists use microscopes, but Foldscope makes it possible for anyone to see these tiny organisms. Jim, can you show us a Foldscope? And Paula, perhaps you could tell us about a few examples of how Foldscope is making a difference. Hi, Marv. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so you can um, see on our uh, slide here what a Foldscope looks like. We designed it to be less than $1 in parts, but to provide performance, which is on par with conventional microscopes. So we could see things as small as single cell bacteria and other pathogens um, of interest. Um, these um, are just a few images that we've taken with Foldscope, showing a variety of different cells um, and the, uh, a range of applications uh, where you can use Foldscope such as for education um, and um, exploring biodiversity, as well as um, in, in the long term for medical applications, although we don't specify it for that at the moment. <clears throat> uh, we, we designed Foldscope to have a resolution of two microns so that you can see um, uh, very small organisms and uh, 140x magnification um, so that those organisms are easily visible with your eye, 
but we also wanted to make it so you can attach it to a mobile phone um, for image capture. Um, and also uh, we're introducing an app which will have image recognition features. I have a video which uh, shows um, various different images and uh, that we've taken with Foldscope. And so uh, we uh, maybe we can share that um, for the next slide. Might be trying to escape from the tape. much. Um, I'd just like to sh uh, do a very quick uh, uh, live demonstration of what Foldscope looks like here. Um, so this, uh, the uh, instrument I'm holding here is a Foldscope. It's made of a synthetic paper which is completely waterproof and um, like the uh, Van Leeuwenhoek microscope that was mentioned, it uses a single ball lens uh, which in our case is made of borosilicate glass. Um, we insert the slide uh, from the back you can clip a light source on or use uh, uh, external lighting. You can view it directly with your eye or you can attach a, a cell phone just by putting a, a magnetic coupler onto your phone, uh, clipping it on and then viewing it like this. And I need to find the sample. The sample got moved. There we go. And so this this is an example of a sample. Uh, these are uh, frog red blood cells. And with a cell phone, the nice feature is that you can also do digital zoom and get a nice 
uh, magnified view of the sample. That's my quick demo. <laughs> Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing, right? Um, so um, just to add to what Jim just shared, we want to make uh, scientific explorations affordable and accessible to everyone all around the world. And, and um, the a characteristic that Jim mentioned that I want to highlight about our full scope is that it's durable, waterproof and portable. Um, you can take it with you to the beach to the mountains, uh, you can use it in warm, cold weather, and you can also take it to the Peruvian Amazon, for example, and that's what we did a couple of years ago, and we were able to see a huge variety of microorganisms and samples, such as pollen. Um, that's an image that um, all of you will look soon, I think, in the next slide, of different uh, microorganisms we saw in Puerto Maldonado in Peru. And one thing we want to share with all of you is that in 2018, we achieved a huge milestone, which is we deployed a million full scopes all around the world. Um, we have uh, reached uh, more than 158 countries, and we are just very ha happy to see how the full scope community keeps on growing. And you can see over there in the map just a all the different areas where we have full scope users and this community keeps on growing and growing. And we have um, a name for where we have a place where our users can share their findings and that's called Microcosmos. So if you go to microcosmos.fullscope.com, you can get to see a wide variety of posts where our full scope users and we call some of them also super users get to share their findings. And just to give you a little taste of the kind of uh, posts uh, you can find. So right with the current situations when we started there uh, lots of talk, um, we started talking more and more about masks. Um, one of our users wanted to look at, at the quality of different kinds of masks. So um, he did that and, and then posted it on our Microcosmos website. So we have actually a screenshot of uh, what the, that post looks like if um, in one of the images. So yeah, uh, it's just an amazing place and, and that's what we want to foster and cultivate a community of people who share um, their findings with each other um, because that's that's how we that's what we envision for the future. Wow, thanks Paula. That's absolutely amazing. And as I was uh, listening to Jim, I realized that not only are you experiencing firsthand some of the, the the wonders there are at the microscopic world you're also reliving some of that excitement and and wonder of someone like van leeuwenhoek or people in the past who for the first time were seeing things that nobody had known before so it's a great scientific tool it's also a great historical tool so we've seen uh, a lot of very interesting microscopic life forms, uh, many of them beneficial and some of them actually quite dangerous. And it's a good thing that we know that there is something that they don't like, namely copper and silver. So we'll turn to Tim. What is it about copper and silver that allow those materials to help us address those nasty organisms? So Marv, there are there's certain uh, metallic ions and those you mentioned, copper and silver, are very effective at uh, destroying uh, different types of bacteria and viruses. So because uh, of the relevance of coronavirus, I give a schematic here on the left hand side of a, a typical coronavirus. And you see it as uh, you know, it's typical features, spike proteins, which allow it to t uh, attach to, you know, healthy cells. Um, you know, an envelope that protects the genetic material on the interior that uh, allows the virus to replicate. But if I take a, a healthy coronavirus cell and expose it to copper one plus ions, as you see on the right hand side, uh, we can pretty rapidly destroy the cell by attacking the uh, the membrane or the uh, envelope that protects the DNA, and then actually it infiltrates the interior of the cell and disrupts the genetic material. So, 
you know, copper and uh, silver work particularly well. And the reason this is, is the ions, you know, once they're released, they're looking for a way to become stable again so that we'll find sites um, that will allow them to reach uh, a more stable electron configuration. And in doing so, they're competing uh, for binding sites with uh, other metals that are typically uh, critical to uh, cell functionality, uh, zinc and iron, for example. And also during the process, these copper ions are going to generate some uh, pretty reactive hydroxyl radicals that are going to also uh, lead to the destruction of these cells. So if I get this right, we've got ions of copper and silver that that breach the fortress, they, they attack the border wall, but then they attack the operating system as well. So it's uh, a multi-pronged attack then, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, if you look at this slide that, you know, we have up right now, um, you know, both can be effective, but what we see through our testing and analysis is that copper is much more uh, antimicrobial and antiviral for that case and you know can work under a wide variety of environmental conditions so in regular uh, room temperature uh, room relative humidities uh, copper is very effective on the other hand if you compare that to silver ions silver can be very effective but it is limited to a high temperature high humidity cases so um, it kind of limits its application space and you know, another way to compare these materials, uh, the downside of the copper material, at least the way that we have uh, discovered to deliver it, is in a glass ceramic type material. And I'll, I'll show that later on. And I guess the downside is it's opaque orange color. I do have a, a coupon of this. And you can see, you know, it's a pretty uh, distinct color for this material, but now, that being the case, it can certainly limit the application space and the things that it can be loaded into in a powder form. Um, on the other hand, for silver ions, we can really readily incorporate this into transparent glass um, through ion exchange processes. All right, so the context suggests and determines really which, which approach you take, but they both function similarly. Uh, similarly, um, copper being much more effective just due to its uh, uh, capability under a, a wide variety of environmental conditions. Great. So the fold scope approach uses a, a different kind of microscopic attack. It, it helps us see the microbes and then you can take some sort of preventative action. So perhaps uh, we'll go to Jim. Uh, can you describe some of the problems that these microbes cause and then um, give a few examples of how seeing them with Foldscope gives us a way to take preventive action? Yes, sorry. Um, yes, thank you, Marv. Um, so there's a variety of different um, microbes that we have uh, viewed with fold scope um, you know some of which are uh, pathogens for humans um, uh, some of the work that we've done is related to uh, schistosomiasis and also a number of different soil transmitted helminths uh, one that i'm showing in the slide here um, is um, a diagnosis of a disease called ascaris and this is diagnosed um, by looking at fecal samples and trying to find um, evidence um, of the um, of the worm, it's a pinworm, uh, in in the uh, intestinal tract by finding eggs um, in the in the fecal sample, and uh, so what I'm showing here, um, we did a brief uh, study of uh, some ascaries, uh, a patient's um, a patient's fecal samples that had ascaries, um, in it, and this um, this image that I'm showing here is actually taken through a conventional microscope to give a reference. Um, so on the left is the image uh, that we took through the microscope uh, and you see a zoomed in section of it which shows uh, one single egg which was visible um, in that sample and we took the same exact sample and we put it in fold scope to determine if that would be visible. Uh, this next slide is a video and so you can see some of the um, 
uh, movement on the slide there um, as during the video. And at certain points in, in, in the movement, you can see uh, little white um, ovals which are reflective. Maybe we can play the video one more time. Uh, you should be able to identify uh, five different little ovals um, in the field of view there. And so those, those are the, um, the eggs which um, allowed us to give a positive identification using Foldscope. And this, um, this is a disease in um, Argentina specifically, which is affecting a lot of uh, children. And um, so it's um, this, the vision um, is to use this as a kit which can help parents sort of uh, screen their children to see if this is an issue which, which needs to be treated. Wow, that, that's absolutely amazing to be able to see those, those little organisms and, and active. So we'll go back to, um, to Tim here. To me, and I suspect to a lot of people in our audience, the antimicrobial glass seems sort of a mind-boggling strategy. I think in part because we think, well, glass is pretty non-reactive, it's inert, it's just there. And yet you're saying that it's actually a very active participant in this strategy. So can you show us an example of the glass and how exactly does this work? How do you deliver copper and silver with glass? Okay, so I'll, I'll go through each. The first one I'll, I'll talk about is the delivery of silver ions. So we can incorporate silver into glasses by immersing an alkali containing silicate glass into molten potassium nitrate. And this uh, elevated temperature ion exchange process uh, creates a silver rich surface layer. And then following processing, where I've already incorporated the silver into the surface, um, in normal usage, we'll see a, uh, a thin hydration layer will form on glass. And in doing so, that there are charged water species such as hydronium that will actually ion exchange with the silver, as shown in the, uh, the diagram on the left-hand side. So, the charged species of water will actually enter the sites previously occupied by silver, replace them, and allow the silver then to migrate out into the solution. Once the ions are in the solution, it'll uh, attack the, the microbes or viruses as uh, shown previously. The schematic on the lower right-hand side is important as I go into the next slide to talk about copper. Because Oh, can you go back one, please? because uh, this shows the local structure that forms around silver and you can see that the the space or the cage around that silver ion is large enough for a water a charged water that is a molecule to enter and replace it and you know that space has to be big enough to allow for a one for one ion exchange and this is necessary to maintain charge neutrality through the process OK, so let's go to the next slide now. Um, like I said previously, copper is way more antimicrobial and uh, active over a large uh, in a span of environmental conditions. So we prefer to use copper ions if possible. The problem with the previous approach is uh, shown schematically on the left hand side. So a glassy silicate network that would form around a copper one plus ion is in fact much too dense. And you know, because of the small cage size around that copper ion, I now cannot effectively get the water molecules or charge water molecules to enter the site. So in effect, it would shut down that ion exchange mechanism. So you know, we realized this problem and to overcome this, we designed a multi-phase glass ceramic, as you can see in the on the top right hand side. The TEM microstructure shows a high durability glass matrix phase, a lower durability glassy phase, and a third phase that uh, makes up the Cu2O or Cu1 plus containing crystals. Now the, the TEM elemental mapping, the, the colored diagram show that the matrix phase is enriched in silica glass, which is known to be a very highly durable material. 
The second glassy phase is uh, comprised of phosphorus and potassium, and that phase surrounds the, the cuprite or Cu1 plus containing crystals. If you look at the uh, lower magnification SEM images below, you see that microstructure again in the three phases uh, from a fresh fractured surface. And then on the right hand side, you see what happens when I expose that to water. So I start to dissolve that low durability phase and gain access to these cuprite crystals. And they then release the Cu1 plus ions that provide the antiviral and antibacterial capability. So the next so lot. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, then I can just wrap up uh, kind of, you know, how this thing works with this slide. So this multi-phase microstructure provides then continuous access to these Cu1 plus containing crystals. You can see on the left hand side, the dissolution of the second phase is a function of time and the uh, access to the Cu2 plus, Cu2O crystals are. Um, and then on the right hand side, if I hold it for a very long time, um, this would uh, be like a use condition. You see, we not only gain access to all of those crystals at the surface, releasing some, um, obviously, but we also start to tunnel into the subsurface to gain access to additional crystals, and that provides this continuous uh, and sustained antimicrobial activity. So this is a pretty sophisticated glass, um, not just the way you're adding the materials, but the way you're you're delivering them because you have to carefully think through the entire process of of how you're producing it and and delivering these uh, these ions. Where would you use uh, antimicrobial glass like this? So we have uh, a lot of uses um, and applications that we are. Uh, you know, working with different customers on. Uh, the first one that we looked at because of its ubiquity is just in paints. So uh, in latex paints, uh, you know, and I have uh, some examples I can show of uh, paint panels, but loaded in at a certain amount, and in this case, 26 grams of the ground powder uh, per liter, you can see pretty significant uh, log reduction in staff is a function of time. So uh, at a level of three, it's considered complete kill. So we get to that point relatively quickly. And we've also shown uh, when looking at, you know, several other types of bacteria, we have similar results. So, you know, anything above four is certainly a complete kill. I can't show this. Uh, See if this will work. This is the powder form of that coupon. I don't know. I'm gonna open it and we can kind of see in there. So we can take that, load it into the paint, and even though it's really orange, you know, we can get pretty a pretty good uh, color palette, and a, and a lot of different uh, paint colors are uh, available. So that's the first thing, but there are many other uh, avenues that we're headed down, including uh, textiles and uh, different types of material additions. So paint like this would be a great, uh, a great opportunity for uh, for hospitals, for example. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's certainly uh, you know where we're headed. You know, we have to overcome and we are overcoming the you know EPA hurdles. You know, this is a biocide type material, so it takes longer to introduce it. Uh, but we're making significant inroads and uh, we will uh, be delivering more and more products shortly. And so this works for bacteria and viruses both? Yeah, so this this slide shows a nice summary of uh, some of the different bacteria viruses and even uh, fungus that we've looked at so far. And you can see we have potency against uh, norovirus, which is known as a very tough to kill virus. Um, different types of coronavirus have been tested now, not the uh, COVID-19 type yet, but uh, since it has that uh, enveloped structure, uh, which is known to be kind of less difficult to kill, uh, we have every expectation that it will be very effective against that. 
Well, that's certainly something to look forward to. Um, maybe you could walk us through a bit of the um, invention process here. I mean, after you've envisioned these technologies, you also still have to solve some engineering challenges to produce them. Um, can you describe one of these engineering problems and how you solved it? And we'll start with Jim. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, so uh, one example is, um, you know, when you have a ball lens, um, you um, it's very small uh, size in order to get significant magnification. And so you need a good way of mounting it and of providing a precise aperture for control controlling the um, the light that's going to be um, ultimately passing through the lens and ending up on the imaging surface such as your eye. Um, and, um, you know, we looked at different ways for doing that. We started out by uh, doing laser cutting of paper um, and we um, ended up uh, discovering um, that a well-known technology um, for producing carrier tape, it's a thermal formed uh, plastic, which is used for typically for pack packaging electronics components um, by using, um, you know, already well established um, methods for fabricating this carrier tape. We were able to produce um, a very nice um, pocket, uh, which I'm showing in the slide there, which um, it's essentially a hemisphere uh, that has a hole punched in the bottom and uh, can be made with high precision but it's extremely cost effective. The uh, carrier tape is designed for packaging um, uh, components such as uh, resistors that um, the selling price in volume of those resistors can be as small as a tenth of a penny or even less. And that of course includes the packaging. So the carrier tape is extremely cost effective, but it allows us to do uh, to take a, a ball lens, which, which itself is quite cheap and convert it into you know, a micron with two micron resolution. And uh, so this is this and it's also very high throughput as well. Um, and it, it's a real to real process. So um, very, very easily automated. So this is one of our innovations, you know, for taking um, sort of a uh, low cost material and converting it um, into something that uh, can give high performance um, and but still without adding a lot of labor cost uh, to that process. Great, thanks, Jim. Tim, any thoughts on engineering? problems you had to overcome? Yeah, so when we were uh, you know, designing this material, you know, we had to figure out how to scale it up. And you know, one thing we quickly realized is the, uh, this glass ceramic or the copper glass ceramic uh, attacks all sorts of refractory materials, all sorts of metals. So your traditional um, melt system refractories, thermo or platinum clad thermocouples, uh, all these materials would get eaten away quickly. So we had dev to devise a, uh, uh, a melting setup that was pretty clever where we water cool the entire vessel, uh, which basically attaches the molten uh, copper glass ceramic to the walls of the furnace. And in doing so, the material becomes the container itself. So that's how we overcame uh, that challenge and uh, it, it has allowed us to scale this uh, material up. Wow, that's an ingenious solution. Definitely out of the box. Uh, I wanna conclude uh, this portion of the episode on a hopeful note. Uh, what kinds of potential impact do you see for your work? And we'll start with Tim. Well, I think the hope is, you know, we can play a role in, you know, combating COVID-19 and other viruses which are, are bound to come in the future. And by getting these materials out there, which are safe to humans, but uh, effective against uh, viruses and bacteria, uh, I think are, is going to be critical. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Paula? Yeah. Um 
as uh, I mentioned earlier at Foldscope, we have a pretty big community that keeps on growing. An example is uh, Mo, a teacher in India who's um, brought Foldscope uh, into um, different parts of India. And, and it's the image you're looking at right now. And so many kids and students have had access to this amazing tool. And um, a project uh, also that came out of the use of Foldscope is um, being able to detect plant pathogens. And uh, actually in the next slide, uh, you can see an image of, of people using that. And um, to address your question, what we want to do in the future, launch more citizen science pro uh, projects, which um, an example of one of those is uh, a group in Chile that wants to use um, a full scope and the community in the southern part of Chile to monitor tox toxic algae blooms. And uh, I, I, recently, a few weeks ago, we launched a mobile app where you can register, log into microcosmos.foldscope.com, and then any posts you make through this app will also get published there. So this, we're hoping that, you know, just using your regular phone, um, you can just share all the images and findings and pairing it with the citizen science projects will allow us to um, generate more knowledge, compare data each person is capturing, and um, yeah, you know, just um, learn more about what's happening all around the world. And yeah, we have um, a vision, and Jim, do you want to uh, talk a bit more about it? Uh, yeah, just, just to expound on what you're saying there, um, I think the, um, the app gives us a huge opportunity for uh, doing data collection, and also, um, you know, we can um, include image recognition features in the app so that people can, you know, um, definitively know what they're looking at and can participate in some of these um, broader citizen science programs uh, that we uh, see as, as uh, part of our future vision. So we hope, you know, over time that we can literally reach um, every child in the world uh, with the Foldscope and that we can uh, just help to improve people's um, access to tools for science and their interest um, in science in general. Um, a lot of times in, um, you know, in high school and uh, different, um, you know, science courses, you're learning about science, but you're not learning to do science. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to do with our products, particularly Foldscope right now, but also more products in the future, is to give people that opportunity to get their hands dirty and to learn you know, what it's like to actually do science. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, this is just so incredible. We've had a lot of questions posted and we'll turn to a few of them to see, uh, let's see. This first one will be for Tim. Does the antimicrobial glass have a useful lifetime? So we, we haven't found it yet. You know, we've test we've done a lot of longevity testing and you know we've seen uh, you know sustained antimicrobial activity I I'm sure that it, it could but we just haven't found that yet so I think from a practical perspective uh, this material has a, a very long lifetime excellent thank you so for team foldscope is there a version that clips to a phone and is it available to consumers? Uh, yeah, the Foldscope, uh, it comes with a magnetic coupler. Uh, it looks like I have one taped to my phone here. So every single Foldscope uh, comes with the magnetic coupler um, and that can be attached to a cell phone and it allows you to, you know, um, uh, connect your, your cell phone to the Foldscope. And now we have an app, both Android and, um, and Apple apps. Uh, so you can connect your phone, you can use the, the camera app, or you can use our app from the App Store or Google Play Store. Yeah, and you can um, and you can get a full scope. Uh, if you go to our website, fullscope.com, mm -hmm. and you go to the shop, you can um, either the shop or through our official distributor, you can purchase one. Excellent. A technical question for Foldscope. What's the numeric aperture of your lens? Yes, um, so the lens that we have right now, um, I believe it is, I have to look up the exact number. I think it's 0.14. Um, 
but um, but yeah, we have um, we have specifications, um, you know, in our uh, plus one paper that we published. But I, I'm normally specifying in terms of uh, resolution. I have to um, I have to confirm that, but I think it's about 0.14. Excellent. And another one for the Foldscope team. Um, we've heard about uh, COVID and uh, maybe there are some interesting other opportunities related to remote learning and uh, not just attacking organisms, but uh, ancillary results of the current pandemic. Yes, um, I'm sorry, that was for Foldscope? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I missed that part. Um, yeah, so um, for uh, re related to COVID-19, there's, you know, of course, a huge uh, push towards remote learning so that um, students continue, uh, can continue their education even in uh, during the time when they can't be in the classroom with other students and with their teachers. And so uh, we've, um, we've made a push uh, to, you know, try to uh, give a lot of support uh, to teachers and to individuals that uh, when to learn uh, to use Foldscope at home. Um, I think, you know, the workshop being together has a great benefit that people can work together and learn uh, different techniques for using Foldscope, but with video chats, um, you can really, um, you know, um, uh, have a lot of those same benefits. And uh, so we're just releasing now an assembled classroom kit so that the Foldscope comes already assembled. It has a lesson plan with it, has all the materials to do those things in the lesson plan. And um, I think it's just, um, it's a time when you know uh, tools for doing remote learning is are, are going to be very valuable, and uh, can really uh, give people the um, opportunity to uh, both you know continue their education at home and also explore their curiosity. Um, I think that's really a really central part of our philosophy is being curious about the world and you know trying to um, trying to see something new in in your everyday life that you never imagined was there. And you can see the excitement and thrill of the students in that video that you showed. It, it truly is amazing when you when you get to see this for the first time. Yeah, we hosted actually um, an online work, online workshop yesterday organized by um, a faculty from UT Dallas. And it was just amazing. It was all online and it was just great how, you know, all of them were following along and preparing their samples and just exploring from their own like houses so that was pretty awesome all right and a final question before we wrap up and this one is for tim do you think we'll ever see antimicrobial glass on our personal devices uh, that's a good question so you know, as i mentioned earlier the the silver ions can be readily incorporated into chemically strengthened cover glasses so you know that that's a distinct possibility um and you know backers cases things like that we can incorporate the the copper material into some of those polymeric materials um so yeah uh, it's certainly quite a possibility all right we'll be keeping track of that uh in the days, months, and years ahead. Well, we've reached the end of our time together, so I want to thank our guests, Dr. Jim Sobolski, Dr. Paula Moreno Roman of Foldscope, and Dr. Timothy Gross of Corning Incorporated. I think this has been a great discussion, and I hope everyone watching it at home has enjoyed it as much as I have. And perhaps you, like I, will want to have another look at some of these videos and slides to catch some of the details that we might have missed the first time which is why this episode of Connected by Glass will be added to the Corning Museum of Glass YouTube channel, along with seven other episodes on a wide range of topics. If you're enjoying Connected by Glass, please consider supporting the Corning Museum of Glass so we can continue to provide you with compelling content. Our next episode is Thursday, August 6 at 1 p.m. Look for more details on our social media soon. We hope you've been inspired to see glass in a new way, in this case, to see how glass saves lives. And we invite you to explore the exciting world of glass at the Corning Museum of Glass. Please head to our website to plan your visit. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, friends. Take care, everyone.